All right. Hey, everybody. Hey, uh, Rachel, you, you need one of these. Marissa has to send you one. I do need one. I have a cup. You sent me a cup. Oh, good, good. Yes, we'll send you more swag. Yeah, every time I talk to people, people are like, hey, by the way, you sent me all this swag, so I'm good with, with like, we have a hoodie, we have we have a pullover that's a little bit different than the hoodie. Um, we have hats now. We're swagging. We're swagging <laughs> bugs. Swag stands for stuff we all get, right? Um, all right. Well, thanks for joining everybody. We'll, we'll let everybody continue to join. We had a great sign up because Rachel is a celebrity in the world of early education. Uh, very happy to have Rachel. Rachel, we've known each other since, uh, I think we met at Chris Murray's show at the Child Care Summit in 2018, I believe. No, and we met at AELL like 2016 or 17. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and probably had too many cocktails and, you know, the dates run together. Um, but we're so glad, I'm so glad we finally connected. Um, Rachel, I could see this turn into a multi, multiple type of thing, you know, every quarter, maybe we'd love to have you. Um, so finally glad to get it done, but real quick, I'm going to run through intros and then I hand it off to Rachel and. Rachel's who you all came for to see, and then uh, and then we'll close it down. So as as the as Rachel is going, please feel free to click Q and A and ask her questions there. If it's something about a resource that Rachel had mentioned, Marissa and I will be in the background trying to give you some direction on that. Uh, and if it doesn't get answered in real time, Rachel will have about ten minutes at the end uh, to answer all questions. So. Um, in case, in case you didn't know, my name's Scott Wayman. I'm the founder and CEO here at Kangaroo Time. Uh, we are privileged to bring you content. Uh, I think most of you know the story, but at the beginning of COVID in March of 2020, uh, we, we came together as a team and said, we're going to stop selling Kangaroo Time. You know, our customers are, are not really um, in buying mode. So they need help, we need to advocate for them. And our mission became um, throwing together as much thought leadership and presenting that to as many people as we could. Um, and this started here. So if, if you roll through our YouTube channel, and by the way, please join our YouTube channel, subscribe, hit the like buttons, do what you got to do. Um, but there is a ton of thought leadership here. And we bring on great ones like Holly Alyssa Bruno, Vernon Mason, Rachel Sapala, Beth Cannon, uh, Evelyn Knight, uh, the, the best and greatest content providers in the world of early education. And we let them do their thing. You know, we we, so, so back to the beginning of COVID, we were doing it like twice a week. We were getting like three to 5,000 people every, um, every webinar. And, and we thought, wow, this, this is crazy. Everybody's thirst for knowledge and guidance and community at the time was so, so big. And what we learned from it was from you all. We, we started learning uh, bits and pieces about the entrepreneur in early education and what you really need. And, and again, more the most important thing was community. So please, uh, please subscribe here. There's an embarrassment of wealth. And look at this, Rachel, we only have 411 subscribers. That's crazy. Um, there's so much. So please join that. Also, we spun up a group called KT Child Care Connect. Um, I'd love to see Rachel start posting here. Um, she's got great content. And in fact, she's, she's a coach. Um, Evelyn Knight is, is a frequent poster here. Uh, Hani, Hani and I do a Facebook live show every two weeks and I make crash jokes and play the, the annoying little brother role, even though I'm like 20 years older than she is. Um, but that's my role. I'm a professional little brother. Uh, but yes, please join our KT Child Care Connect group and Facebook. Um, and we won't sell to you, we promise. We just want community. We wanna bring people together. And then Marissa, Marissa, thank you so much. She brings together so much great content for us and 
She has focused on content for the last year. Go to our blog, subscribe. Uh, you will get all kinds of content and, and more of the jackassery from me uh, with Hani is, is sometimes posted there. So, so please um, take advantage of those resources. All right, so for today, um, you will be getting certificates. If you signed up and you are joining, we will send you confirmation that you attended the session. You'll get continuing education. If you have questions, Rachel is an active listener. I've talked with her many a times. Um, she will answer those after she's done. Or again, like I said, we can, uh, we can, we can be in the background doing a little research for you. Um, you've all seen how disastrous Zoom can be. You go to the bathroom, you forget your cameras on. I do it twice a week. People yelling at me, no, don't take your pants off. Um, so, so we're not watching you. We can't see you. We can't hear you. Um, but please chat with us. Let us know where you're from. Um, we always love the support, the, the, the uplifting, go get them girls and boys um, in the chats. And then we're recording this. So we will send this out tomorrow. Or actually, Marissa has been really good. Sometimes you get them same day. Um, so let's get started about Rachel. Rachel is a child care business coach for the Child Care Success Company and brings over 23 years. She started when she was seven. Um, she's a multi-site child care owner and founded Discovery Kid Zone in 2009. She has a passion for mentoring and coaching. I've seen this. It's, it's contagious. Um, she loves to work with fellow business leaders. She has a heart of service like, like I do. She wants to help people. Um, today, Rachel will focus on how to attract and retain staff at your center. Uh, Rachel, welcome. I'm going to unshare. We are so in love with you and so happy to have you. Um, this is a dream come true. So welcome. I'm going to throw it over to you and I may or may not be back depending on when you are done, but so glad to have you. Welcome. Well, thank you, Scott. And thank you, Marissa, for setting this up. And I'm super excited to talk to you all today. And today we're going to talk about the great resignation, which has been a big talk in um, our country right now. And, and it's just crazy. We're just Everyone is like, where are all these people going? And we've noticed lately that people are starting to slowly starting to come back, but we've been struggling for the longest time. And this has been our biggest pain point, especially in childcare, is where are these people going? Because we work off of ratios. It's not like we can just, you know, give somebody a couple extra extra shifts or they might not get their hamburger out on time or something like that. But we have to have ratios, so we have to have people, and we're in this, this weird situation right now where we are can't expand. Like We have more kids than we know what to do with most of our programs because kids are coming back, but all the workers aren't coming back. So we have to figure out what we can do to not only, oops, sorry, not only um, attract more staff, but how can we retain them better? So, hold on, there we go. Okay. So the, the thing that we've been, you know, all talking about is how are we going to keep our staff? How are we going to attract more staff? And we get into this rut of, you have to follow the rules, here's the policy, here's the SOPs, here's, you know, we get into that, that rut of this, this is what we have to do. But then we forget that we aren't, just you know, making people do different things. We need to unleash the power within them. We need to see these creative souls come to life because that's when people are gonna be at their best is when they're creative and when they want to be there, when they want to create things in their classrooms, when they want to create community within your schools and within your families. So that's something that we have to get back to. It's not that we're creating these obedient citizens that come to work on time and turn in their lesson plans on time Time and all of that, but that they want to be there. So, because if not, then why are we here? Like, why do you come to work every day? Why do you have a program that you've created? Or you're, if you're a director, if, if you're not doing those things, then it's, you're just going to lose the drive and you're going to burn out. So a little bit about me, um, Scott said a little bit, but 
I started my programs in my basement in 2009, and I only had four children, and it was just part-time preschool. My goal was to make $400 a month so that I could help pay the mortgage. And from that, I mean, I always had a background in preschool, a preschool teacher, but then from that, it grew really, really fast. And so I had to figure out pretty quickly how to run a business as a preschool teacher, which wasn't easy because that was not what I wanted to do. But I learned um, and how I did it was just serving the needs of the community. If the community wanted to be, you know, Montessori, I became Montessori certified. If we wanted summer camp, I added a summer camp program. If we wanted an infant toddler program, I added an infant toddler program. And along the way, I just figured things out. And through the process, I became um, Montessori certified. Like I said, I got my master's degree in early childhood administration. And now I'm a multi-site owner in two different states and became a child care success academy business coach. So my passion, like my deep rooted passion, like Scott said, is training and mentoring other people, whether it's teachers, directors, owners, I learned early on when I was a teacher because teaching was always my passion. I, I went to school to be a teacher and I just always wanted to be a teacher. And when I became a director owner, I was scared that people wouldn't, aren't going to be able to, that I was going to be able to teach anymore. But when I had, I had the revelation that this teacher, I watched the teacher teach a circle time and she taught it exactly how I would have taught it, but I didn't train her. So that was the revolution revelation to me was that I can train somebody else to train somebody else. And then so many more kids are going to be impacted. And so that's when my passion really grew. And I decided I want to train teachers and I want to train directors and owners, and then they're going to be able to train their people. And then all these kids are going to be impacted. So that's why I'm so passionate about what I do training and mentoring other teachers and directors and owners. Okay, so we've all seen this, right? Like we've all seen help wanted, must have a pulse, help wanted, we, please, if you can stand up, come to work, everybody is hiring and it's mostly the servant industry. That's where we're seeing, seeing the biggest lack in staff. Um, and this is where we're struggling and we don't know what to do. We've done all the, these different things. And studies have shown us that 40% left their jobs because of burnout. 28% left their jobs without even another job left out, lined up. They just don't even care. Like, meh, whatever. I'll just find something, I guess. Because there's so many, everybody's hiring. 37% were looking for better compensation. We got into this $15 an hour mindset. Well, I, in my state, in Montana, our our minimum wage is only 920. And people are wanting coming in wanting 17, 18 dollars an hour with no experience and no education. And it's because the whole country thinks you have to make at least 15 dollars an hour. So we're trying to figure out what to do with this situation. And even the World Health Organization considers burnout a true medical condition. Like, really? Like, how are we going to combat this as owners and directors? If we keep having this coming at us over and over and over again. So I told myself, it is my job to make sure everybody is happy. And if they don't, and if I don't pay them more, they will leave me. So this was the lie that I told myself. I got stuck in this rut. I got stuck in this. Oh my gosh, I'm a three. If you know Enneagram scores at all. So my worth is in my work and I want to make everybody you know, happy and feel like they're being compensated well. So I told myself the lie that I have to pay people more or they'll leave me. And I'll just, I keep having to pay people more and keep having to pay people more. How many of you just in the chat real quick felt that same lie? And that's what you told your people or told yourself. So you kept having to pay more and then you felt like you were running out. Yes. Kay and Karina. I know. And it just, and then you feel like, where is the money going to come from? I keep paying these people. I keep paying these people. Okay, there's grants, but I can't raise the rates anymore. And I can't, and the grants are going to run out. So then you feel like, exactly, okay, what money? So then you start to feel like, oh my gosh, 
then you start to get scared because then you're like, where is the money going to come from? And then you just work around the clock. Like I did not sleep. I was up all the time trying to come up with new strategies and new ways to figure out how to beg, borrow and steal and pay these people. And then it starts to come out of the bottom line because you don't know how else you're going to make it work. So then you're sacrificing your own hard earned money and your own family's future and legacy because you don't know what else to do. So then you feel like you're trapped and you're stuck in this hamster wheel of, I have to pay them more. I have to pay them more. I have to pay them more. They're going to leave me because guess what? Your people are your product. So if they leave you, you ain't got nothing. You ain't got no business. You ain't got nothing to sell because your teachers are all gone. So it becomes this vicious cycle of fear, fatigue, sacrifice that you're stuck in. So these are the things that I tried and I want you guys to put in the chat right now, some of the things that you tried to try to help in this situation. So we, we increased our pay skill three times in matter of fact. We did hiring bonuses. We did matching bonus. We did hiring bonuses for parents, for staff, current staff, for new staff. Um, we did, we raised our rates twice. And we also had a lot of grants. So what are the, some of the things that you guys tried to do, put it in the chat right now, to try to help solutions and really desperations that you tried to get, do to help attract staff and retain staff? Hiring bonus of $1,000, raised rates, weekly lunches, every single one of those, staff appreciation, retreats, sign-on bonus, lots of praying, right? Paying for EDU classes. So we do all of this stuff. And like I said, the money runs out or we see the money running out. And so we start to get panic like oh my gosh what are we gonna do and money becomes the focus it became the focus of me and I'm not a really money focused person and so I know that even that for most if not everyone money became the focus how many of you feel like during the last two years or at least the last year and a half that paying your staff and trying to make more money just to pay your staff has become your primary focus Me, me, me. Yes, exactly. And then when money becomes our focus, guess what happens? We start to lose our passion and we, it becomes a job. So we feel helpless because we're like, money has become our focus. So we've lost our passion. And then we don't know what to do because we don't know how to keep making more money. The money's gonna run out. We don't know what to do. We feel stuck. And it's because we've become tunnel visioned, focused on money. And right, in cases also trying not to lose money because you know at the beginning and middle of the pandemic, we're losing money from the kids not being there. And so we become, we feel completely helpless and we don't know what to do after that. When's it gonna end? When are we going to be able to see the light at the end of the tunnel? We're managing, right? We're, we're there, we're surviving, but it's, we're not thriving. And it wasn't fulfilling because we don't, we're not living out our purpose because our purpose every day turns into how am I going to make more money? And how am I going to pay these people more, more money? And guess what? Their focus also becomes about money because then they start to focus on, you don't pay me enough for this. How many of you heard that? Or I don't, you should just pay me more or I'm going to leave. Or I can just go down the street and make 25, 50, a dollar more an hour working at McDonald's. So then guess what their focus is on? It's on money. But hello, it comes from the leader. So you are the one that's feeding that. If your focus is on money, and trying to figure out how to make more money so that you can pay them more. It's not so that you can make more money. That, that ship sailed a long time ago. No, we're trying to figure out how to pay them more money 
So then our focus is on money. So it's shifted now down to our team because now their focus is also on money. So then, they, then we start to get into a burnout cycle. And this is what it looks like. Starts with poor communication, then lack of control and trust. And guess what? If you are focused on money as an owner, as a director, if that's your focus, then you're not communicating well because you don't know how to communicate. Like, how, where's the money going to come from? How much more am I going to get paid? Uh, <laughs> so then you start with poor, it starts with poor communication, then lack of control and trust. So if you're not communicating well, what, where the money's going to come from or how you're going to pay them more. So then they start to lose trust in you. And then you don't know where you're going to get the money from, right? So then your vision is not clear because you've lost your purpose and you've lost your focus. So they don't know what the vision is. Then the lack of accountability starts to slip because shoot, if you show up and you're, you know, you're walking and breathing, sure. Even if you show up a half an hour late, whatever, I don't know, just get in your classroom. So then lack of accountability starts to slip. So then those A players start to lose trust. And then, then you start to have burnout in the A players, which is the ones you do not want to lose. So then you start to have feelings of inadequacy. They start to feel inadequate because they're not being rewarded for being an A player because who cares about A players anymore? As long as you breathe, it's fine. And then they start to not want to contribute. There's no mission. Then you've got an entire culture that has lost their passion and their joy. So you've got an entire culture that has burnt out from the top down. And that's what we've been experiencing in the last 18 months. But I'm not going to be all sad and downy Deborah this, Debbie this whole time. Mom, trust me. <laughs> There's hope. So I started to have a bonus system and I was super proud of it. And we have KPIs attached to it so that we can measure their performance and we can measure it on a scale so that we know exactly what everybody's score is and we have it into scored categories and they, they get bonuses based on their performance. So this did help elevate our A players because they thought, okay, finally, we've got this bonus system so they can make up to $2 more an hour and it's totally based on performance. It's not subjective. There's no favoritism happening. And so then they feel like, okay, so these people that are just breathing, at least they won't get a bonus. And I, me who's working it over here, I'm going to, uh, at least I'll get a bonus. So then there, there became purpose again. There became a vision. There became, this is why we're here. And this is what we're doing to, you know, elevated our expectations. And so, and rewarded them for it. So that helped. And I thought, oh, this is the solution. This is going to be the solution. I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. And I was so excited that we were finally going to get through this freaking pandemic and get to the, make it to the other side to where we have, a, we have a goal now. We have a goal and we're gonna make it and it's gonna be okay, right? Well, that's what I thought. So, and then I realized that I was still focused on money. <laughs> So even though I had a plan to get to the other side and I thought I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, I had, I was still focused on money. And so one of my, my office managers came to me and she said, we've just rolled out this bonus plan. Everybody's excited and whatever. And she came to me and said, I feel like our morale is down. And I was like, I was so heartbroken because culture, is my thing, like having a good staff culture is my thing. Like that's what I work so hard for. It's where we started from, like from the beginning when we had no money to do anything, but we always had this strong, tight tribe, this strong, tight culture and we're a place where everybody wanted to work and play. And that's kind of always been my thing. And when she said that, it broke my heart. And I was like, what do you mean our staff morale is done down? We have all of these bonuses coming out. It's going to be so much better. We've raised our pay scale multiple times. I, I was so confused. And she said, it's because we don't do the fun little like 
weekly potlucks and dress up days and notes on our door and all of these things that we used to do. And I was like, oh my gosh, you are so right. I had completely lost focus. I was so focused on money, so focused on paying these people more and trying to get and raising our expectations and having this, da, 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 everybody come to work, do your SOP, you know, do, fall in line, do what you're expected and I'll pay you for it. But then, but we lost the touchy feely culture, the why, the passion, the play. And so I had to completely reshift my mindset to, yes, we still have the scorecards. Yes, we still do the bonuses and all of those things, but that's not what makes it great. That's not what makes people want to come to bet to work every day, to get up in the morning and to, to change diapers all day long if they have to, or to get puked on or whatever. That's not it. Like you can't pay me enough is what some people might say. And that's true. You have to want to come to work. There has to be a bigger drive. There has to be a bigger goal and vision. So that's when I realized I have to go back to stop focusing on money and to make it more about fun and to make it more about culture and connection. And like Scott said at the beginning, the reason why they created um, this community with Kangaroo Time, and I agree, I follow all their pages and I love it. And it's about community. It's about our little early childhood community and connecting with others. And that's what your program should be like as well. So the key to having a strong culture is through connection. So that's what I realized. I realized that people are leaving their companies because they don't feel connected. People are not coming back to work because they don't have a reason to. They don't feel that connection. You have to build that connection on the first interview, on the very first email that you contact them with, the message, the phone call. You need to connect with them immediately. And that is how they're going to want to be part of your culture. You have to connect with them visually on your careers website. You know, whatever you're doing, you have to want them to want to connect more or, you know, make them want to connect more. So your culture is your brand. So even though you've got the best SOPs, you have the best looking program, you know, you do all of the things that you're supposed to do. If you don't have a great culture where people want to come and work and play, then you don't have a brand. So you have to go back to what does my culture look like and how am I nurturing that on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly basis and be very intentional about it. Because like I said before, your people are your product. So you have to nurture your product. Do you have to, you have to figure out like what, if you have a product, so you're selling, you're selling cars, for example. If your car, if your all your cars are broken or they're not driving forward, you're going to go in there and try to figure out how to make your cars work at their best, you know, at their best so that you can sell them, right? If your people are broken, they're not happy, they don't love coming to work and doing what they're doing, or you're losing people all the time, you have to figure out what's broken so that you could sell a good product. Otherwise, you're not, you're not selling, you're not being true to your people, to, to your families. All right, so... Connection reminds us of why we're doing what we're doing. So some in the chat, everybody put something that you've done in the past to try to drive connection in your company or something that you've done in the past to try to drive connection when you start to hire. Yes, I'm in Montana, <laughs> but I travel a lot. <laughs> Motivational quotes is a good one. Yeah, we do that. What else? What are some other ideas? Food at the meetings. <laughs> you know that if somebody's love language is gifts, food is a gift. Food, coffee, all those things, that's, that's feeding their love language. If that's something that you give, sap gifts, games. Hey, that's my person, Claire. Facebook groups. Yeah, it's super important that you have connection groups. We have a Facebook group and we also have Sling if you guys use that. But any kind of communication tool where your staff are connecting, sharing content, different things, that's super important. Chocolates, 
personal conversation on an interview. Yeah, one-on-ones, core value recognition, all great ideas, guys. Awesome. So just make sure that culture is your driver. So make, so you kind of like shift your mindset, right? Like I need to make money, obviously I'm a business, but you need to make money. So this is your ultimate goal, but culture needs to be your driver. Okay. So that's how you're going to get there. That's how you're going to get to the goal is by increasing your culture. So culture is your solution, not money, not paying them more. I mean, obviously you have to compensate them. I'm not saying don't pay, but you know what I mean? But we can't just have keep paying more and more and more and more and more. All right. Um, okay. So then once you start to do that, then you start to have an upward spiral. Okay. So now we have contribution, right? We're, com we're, com we're com contributing to the community of our school. We're contributing to our staff. So now we feel this sense of community, like Scott said. Then the vision is starting to be more clear. Then we have more collaboration because we want to be together. We want to build and create and do all these fun things. Then we celebrate staff development. We're celebrating each other. We're celebrating our community. We're building it. Then we're being a role model. Then our positivity is, is contagious. Then our passion is on fire. Then our purpose is evident. And then we just grow. And once your people start to want to grow on their own, it's gonna make your program so much better for the kids, so much better for the parents, so much better for each other. And it's all coming from within, it's intrinsic. It's not something that you're saying, you have to do this much professional development and this much blah, 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 or you're not gonna get blah, 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 blah. No, you're influencing them to want to do better on their own and it's passion and it's contagious. So yesterday we had our, um, we have two annual meetings every year. So biannual, I guess. And we do a really fun thing with lots of swag and we feed them and fun games and all of those things. And we had Beth Cannon come, who's amazing by the way. And Beth Cannon came and did a really great culture building workshop for my team. And it wasn't like the typical way that we would train our team. It was all about connection and all about getting to know each other better. And my staff is on fire now because they're just so excited and like, oh, I know that, you know, more about the Enneagram, that person's a two, so she's gonna be a helper and, you know, all of those things. And it just has become, you know, it's, it's on fire and it just keeps growing. So I always, like I said, culture was our baby. It was something that we always focused on. It was something that we always, you know, put our effort into. But in the past, and then I got lost with trying to focus on paying people more, but in the past, it was just like willy nilly, like, ah, oh, let's have a, let's have a staff dress up day, or let me buy everybody coffees, or let's do this or that or that, you know, whatever, just different things, or let's go do this thing. And there was no like rhyme or reason to it. And so it still made me feel like I was like constantly stressed out, like constantly had to do more. And the reason why is because my culture, it was a Band-Aid. So it was constantly like, okay, let's buy everybody coffee because they had a rough week or let's do this because, you know, whatever. And it was constantly a Band-Aid. So I constantly felt frazzled. I constantly felt like I was fighting fires of, you know, trying to fix every little thing. Oh, this person needs more focus because of this. So I need to help that person. But then while I'm doing that, then this person over here is struggling and you know, whatever. And then I felt like I was, it was never enough. And I was still in the sleepless night hamster wheel phase. I finally realized that it needs to be intentional and culture as a solution, not as a band-aid and not just like, here's a coffee. I hope you're better for right now. No, no. Like culture needs to be like embedded throughout your entire program. This is what we do. This is how we live. So it needs to, they need to have clarity. They need to know what to expect. Your team, your directors, your leadership needs to know what's coming up, what to expect. It needs to have connection and not just like, here's your coffee and walk out. No, you need to connect with these people. It needs to have purpose. It's because of that, it's improved my health. The company runs more efficiently. I have more rest. The, my directors have more rest and play. 
And it's just, it's just, it's become a system. It's become automatic and it's become the way that we do. So let me tell you some things for, of what we do. So team clarity of vision allows them to connect with purpose. So if you remember at the beginning, I said that your focus, my focus was on money and how to pay these people more and how to, you know, how do I do this? How do I get more grants? How do I raise the rates? How do I do all these things so that I can pay these people more? So that was my, that was my vision was to pay people more. And so then that became my company's vision. And that was icky. So we've had to switch to our vision is culture. Our vision is connection. Our vision is play. And so now it's allowed my directors to connect with purpose and my teachers to connect with purpose. So it starts from the top down and then it's able to, you know, just bleed from the inside out. Oops. Sorry. Okay. So the six reasons why um, the six most important incentives a company offers are. So I read a study that said like the reasons why people leave the company that they're working for. You know, they, they, they say you leave a manager, right? But a lot of it, there's a lot more that goes into it. So the things that you can do to combat this, there's six reasons why people stay are internal company communication. So like Claire said in the chat, like having Facebook groups, Slack channels, Sling, different things where you're constantly able to communicate and the communication is very clear and it's, and you have an, an, an channels for that. So it's not like, oh, they texted me over here. They emailed me over here, but I lost it and never responded. It has to be very clear so that everybody knows what to do and what to expect. Then number two is company sponsored activities and events, having big events. Um, a lot of people will say, I can't afford to have events. It's, I don't have the time for it. You do not not have the time for it. And you do not not have, you have to do it. You have to make it a priority because these are why people stay. We just had a huge event in January and we were give out big prizes like TVs and all these fun things. And we decorate it, you know, from top to bottom and have a theme and hire a DJ and feed them all and everything. And everyone is just on a high after stuff like that because they just love the connection. They love to feel like, oh my goodness, this is only for us. This is only for our company. And they just feel so special. And then they say, I, they love where they work. So it's super important that you make those a priority and you budget them in. Recognition programs, having ways to recognize your staff regu regularly and not just like I said, the coffee here and there, but actually having recognition programs. We do like an work anniversary bonuses and then we recognize them on social media. Incentive programs, like I said, the bonus program, skill development. Some people in the chat said they offer CEU classes. We do CDA, we, we're an apprenticeship program so they can do get college scholarships for free and all of those things. Figure out ways, research and make it a priority to incentivize your, your people so they wanna stay. But not only that, but it makes it so they stay long-term and you're building up your team long-term. We have a, a program called My App and it's a youth apprenticeship program. So these people are starting when they're 16 and then going through college and then working. So we're, we're funneling lead teachers in from the beginning. So think of ways to do that. Skill development, you know, cl we close one night or one night early a month so that we can have skill development for your staff. Wellness programs, a lot of mental health. I've heard people that are doing like call-in um, psychologists and call-in therapists that it's just a program that they offer their team so that they can have somebody to talk to a lot of mental health things, um, massages and things like that, that will just help with their mental health yoga. We did yoga, anything that you could do to make the quality of your people's life in and out of work better is going to make them want to stay with you longer. All right. So I just want to give you, and then at the end of this, there's a freebie um, that you get three free books from the Chris Murray Library. And also I have a freebie at the end that's going to get to be an action plan of how you can plan out your incentive, you know, your year with your staff so that you can have a, a plan, an action plan that makes it 
more relevant. So the first thing that we do is we choose a word for the year. So for example, our word this year is thrive. So you choose a word for the year and then you brainstorm with your leadership team or whoever and you figure out what your word is for the year. And then you plan out your training theme for a whole year. So like, what are we gonna do for a whole year? So for example, our word is thrive. So our first 90 days is you deserve to thrive. So all of our training, all of our parent education, all of that is, is focused on mental health and you deserve to thrive. The next quarter is thriving classrooms. So all of our training and everything is focused on in indoor environments, curriculum, how can we help parents understand our curriculum better and all of that, that's focused on that. The next one is you thriving outside. So then we're focused on outdoor classrooms, um, parent family events, outdoors, hiking, you know, we're in Montana. So all the great outdoorsy stuff in Montana, that's what all our education and community events and training and everything will be on that. And then the last quarter is thriving in our community. So then we're taking everything that we've done this entire year, and then we're throwing it out into the community and bringing the community in. So through that, you are able to plan your trainings. You're able to plan your staff appreciation things. You're able to plan your community events. You're able to plan your um, staff trainings and all of those things throughout the entire year so that it all makes sense. And then it becomes very intentional. So how many of you are the type of people that choose a word a year? Like choose a word a year for yourself. Like my word is impact this year or choose a word a year for your company. In the chat, put in there, how many of you do a word a year? And how many of you have never thought to take that practice into and make it into a business practice? Cultivate, I like that. Of course it is, Marissa. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of you, you know, use a word of the year as a practice for yourself, but it's never, it, most of you have not thought of it as a business practice. But like I said before, it was, it was never, my culture, you know, ideas and things like that was never consistent. It was never, it never had drive. It never had focus. It never had vision. And so my team felt loved. And they, you know, whatever, it, it worked for them. But for me and my leadership team, it was kind of just like, ah, we need to do staff appreciation. What are we doing? You know, so this has focused us much better. I'm glad you're making notes. Okay, so this is just an example of our school calendar and how one month and how we've taken that and broken it down. So like I said, we, we plan the whole year, then we plan the quarters, and then we plan the months, the weeks, the days. I mean, like we break it down to like the entire thing. So we break down like one-on-one -on -one meetings. Those are on the calendar. So to make sure that the directors all are getting all their one-on-one -on -one meetings. We break down, you know, all of our checklists. So all of their scorecards are getting done. All of our admin and director meetings. This is the master calendar for the staff. And then we, we throw in teacher dress-up days and, um, potlucks and then we do a family event like this is a learn the line dance thing then we have two teacher trainings every month one of them is optional one of them's mandatory and we feed them and then they all have a theme and then the, the training is along with that theme and then we have every single week we do graph staff gratitude day and it's not necessarily monetary it can be like this one is buy them their favorite drinks and then it could be notes on their door. We, we try to focus on the five love languages. So we try to focus like one week we'll do a gift type of thing. One week we'll do like a words of affirmation thing, a touch thing, like where we'll high five or whatever. And then we'll do um, quality time. So we'll give them like an extra 15 minute break where they can go hang out with the director or, or we'll have two people have a 15 minute break together so they can hang out with their teacher buddy or whatever, just different things so that we're trying to hit like all the five love languages and then we'll do community events like grandparents day, you know, book fair, all of those different things. Um, so this kind of just by doing this, it's really focused us as a leadership team 
And it's also focused me and made me be like, okay, I can breathe. Like the whole year is planned out. We have everything planned. We discuss it weekly on our L10 meetings to make sure that we're on track or if something needs to change or whatever. Um, but it just makes it so much more intentional and culture, like I said, is the driver. Okay, so these are just some ideas of some of the things that we do that you guys can do. We do a leadership retreat every year where we're, that's where we do our strategic planning. That's where we plan out the whole year. We get our theme of the year and everything else. But we also, you know, love on them and have fun and do team building activities too. And then we do, um, every year we do a staff retreat for our whole staff. And then we do a teacher in service day, which is what we just did. And they're always a theme. They always have games and um, training and, I, and swag and whatever else that all go along with the theme. So we did like Survivor this year was our big thing because um, we're doing Survive to Thrive. So it was Survivor and then Thrive started in January. Um, so we did like Survivor challenges and things like that. And Survivor, we had the immunity idol and the food, whatever. Everything goes together with the theme. And it was at a retreat place up in the mountains. Um, so just thinking of ways to really build, love on your staff, but in an intentional way and not just, oh, let's go here and do this. You know, that sounds like fun. Um, but also like budget this stuff in because if you budget staff retreats, leadership retreats, big staff parties and all of those things in, you would be surprised at how much that cost compared to giving everybody in a dollar an hour raise. I mean, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars if you're a big company like mine to give out a dollar raise and people don't notice a dollar, but guess what? They're going to notice when they're going to a survivor retreat and they got a hundred dollar gift card because they won a prize or, you know, whatever, different things. They want a TV at the staff party. Um, they're going to notice those things because it gives them the, the emotional connection which is what we're trying to do. We want to connect with them. We want to give them these emotional connections because that's how our brain is wired so that we want to come to work. We want to have those connections. We want to keep doing what we're doing and have purpose. Okay, so lastly, when you work for a purpose that is bigger than yourself, it's not just about the money. It's about who, it's about where we're going and who we're going with. So I just want you guys to really remember that and to always be focusing on trying what your driver is. Make culture your driver. Money is your goal because you have to run a business, but culture is how you're going to get there. And you're going to take, you're going to stand by your team and you're going to say, we're going to do this together. So that's all I have for you guys. And these are the two um, freebies. So this one's the action plan, like I said, and Marissa said she's going to send this out to you guys so that you can get that. It's a step-by-step -step action plan to kind of do what I said, to plan out your year. And then the three books from the Child Care Success Academy. So are there any questions or anything that um, you want me to discuss with you guys? That was awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. You're welcome. Yeah, any other questions, just throw them in the chat or the Q&A. And like Rachel said, I'm going to follow up with you guys and I'll send you the links to the, both of the freebies so you can reference them at any time. And then you'll have the recording as well. Does anybody have any questions or any clarity on anything they want me to answer or any resources um, that I can maybe direct you to? I'm, I'm, uh, I have a little bit of energy. <laughs> uh. How to phrase hiring questions that, that's a good question. How to phrase hiring questions that reflect your core values. So one of the questions that I ask, I, I just retook over hiring because of staffing. So, um, one of the questions that I asked is, um, tell me your, your most important personal core value and why is this important to you? That's something that I asked them. And then I tell them what, my core, what our core values are and I ask them to choose a core value that resonates with them the most and why. So that's how, and, core, and character is my number one thing when I hire. 
if, if you have all the qualifications in the world, but you, you don't have good character, or I just feel that you're not going to be, if you're, you're entitled or something like that, then you are not a fit for our company. Because like I said, culture is super important to us. So that's a good question. Um, management, money, staffing, and learning culture. Yes, Larissa, I have been janitor, cook, teacher, director, owner, <laughs> all the things. So I un totally understand what you're going through. And honestly, taking, like, go lock yourself in a closet, go somewhere where you can be like by yourself, quiet, and just taking a day, even if it's just you and really choosing a word for the year and planning out your entire year for your company in just a few hours, it's going to help your brain not feel so stuck. You're not gonna be in the clouds. You're gonna be able to get a, you know, a bird's eye view of where you want your company to go this year. And it's gonna help you not feel like you're drowning as much. Rachel, is there a way they can contact you directly if they have any oh, other yeah. questions? Here, let me put my... my email is in the chat. Also, if you click on this, if you go to this Discovery Kids on IKS Center slash training, that will take you to my landing page. And so then I'll have your contact information also that way. I guess I can put that in the chat. Um, discovery. Yeah, that's how you can get the, the freebie and also I can get your contact information that way. Since we're in the middle of the school year. You can still do it in the middle of the year. You can still say like next quarter. So like first quarter is ending pretty soon. So you can say starting next quarter, this is going to be what we're doing for the next three quarters. It's all, it's just strategic planning. So it doesn't, I mean, ideally you do January to December, but it doesn't have to be. It's whenever you decide I'm going to start planning. I wouldn't wait a year for sure. I mean, I would definitely start whenever you can. But that's a good question. Does anybody else have any other questions? Or anything I can help you with? Awesome. Yeah, well, if there's no other questions, um, I'll include Rachel's email in the follow-up as well. So you can always do that. Carolyn asked another one. How do I plan one-on-ones? -on -ones? So I am a multi-site program. So how I do it is I do my one-on-ones -on -ones with the directors and they're on, the, they're on our Google calendar. So they're scheduled out. And then my directors are 30 minutes. And then the, the directors plan their one-on-ones, they're 15 minutes. And we were finding that by scheduling them, it was too difficult because it would be like, I have a one-on-one -on -one scheduled with Monica and Monica's not here today. So instead of doing that, we do time, we do blocks of time. So the directors will get like two or three hours, depending on how big their school is and how much are on their staff to do one-on-ones. It's like the third Monday of the month or something like that. So they schedule it out that way so that they know from this time to this time is blocked out for one-on-ones for whoever's here. And hopefully it's, you know, everybody, but um, so that's how we do it now instead of doing the team does it once a month. I do the directors every two weeks because their score. So we do scorecards. So the team scorecards are once a month and the director's scorecards are biweekly because one of their scores is determined on payroll percentage. So we meet biweekly based on their scorecards. That's a good question though. And one-on-ones are so important. When we first started doing one-on-ones, it was really hard for the directors to prioritize that um, because they have so many other things to do. And we started seeing that people wanted their one-on-ones so bad that literally we had people quit because they didn't get their one-on-one. -on -one. 
So we made sure that it became a priority because they feel they need to feel valued and heard, right? So they need those one-on-one -on -one times. And another thing that I started doing because, you know, they, people like to, the team was sucking my director's time. And so the, then they would say, I didn't have a one-on-one. -on -one. Well, girlfriend, you were in my office every single day last week. What do you think that was? So I started training my directors that every time somebody comes into their office to just talk, then they would turn that, they would say, okay, this is your one-on-one. -on -one, and they pull up their one-on-one -on -one sheet and record it so that they understood we are having a one-on-one -on -one right now. Um, it's just not during the normal one-on-one -on -one time. My scorecard method, I use one place. So I developed our scorecards on one place and it's scored based on, that's a whole nother webinar, but it's scored based on um, the expectations that I have and the non-negotiables. So the non-negotiables are ones that they'll get minus scores for. And then at the end, we have three tiers that they'll get a bonus on based on where they score within those tiers, their percentages. I don't know if that really helped. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, we just have a few minutes left, but you can keep chatting if you have anything final before we wrap up. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, thank you again, Rachel. That was awesome. And everyone, thank you for coming and keep an eye out for your emails. Um, I'm gonna be sending everything over again so you have it all. And if you need anything else, just reach out to Rachel or you can reach out to some time and we'll help you out. Yeah, thank you guys. It was really fun to be on here and um, I am I would be, I'd love to do it again. And I do, I would add some stuff to the Facebook group or anything else. Absolutely. Okay, great. That sounds perfect. Well, thank you guys. It was great seeing you all and we'll see you next time. Okay. Bye, Rachel. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.